league members who work at elections and other people have other things going on that day too. So um, we will not have Civic Buzz in November and it will be reintroduced in December. And um, also want to say that we um, are collaborating with Whittier Alliance um, for this program. And um, hopefully if you um, get the emails about it, you can share information about our programming with your friends and, and neighbors and whoever. Um, I will start now and talk a little bit about Commissioner Linda Higgins, who's next to me here. She has a wealth of experience in government. Um, tonight, uh, we'll all talk about county government and the impact on our daily lives. She'll soon be leaving her post as commissioner, so now's a good time to get some answers to all sorts of questions you may have about the county, its budget, and how it functions in this community. I asked her what's next on the agenda. Her answer, up north. Apparently she's going to go up north, spend more time up there at the family cabin and maybe down the road um, and within the year or so she'll reveal she's got some other plans um, for her future. Uh, she was born in Northern Iowa on a farm and became a city girl as she served downtown Minneapolis and North Minneapolis at the state, in the state Senate. Six appears to be her magic number. She was in the state Senate for 16 years. She's been a commissioner for six years, and I was told she lives in a 116-year-old house. She's a graduate of Mankato, and probably did that in less than six years, I would imagine. <laughs> um, she's also served, when she was in the state Senate, served um, on committees and was chair of the elections committee and also the state and local government committees. Uh, those committees would be some things league members would be um, interested in. So without further ado, I will um, let Commissioner Higgins speak to the group and um, we will have a Q&A afterwards and then maybe I'll convene it again and we may have a few little um, short discussion groups about the county and its budget and whatever other things are pertinent in your life. Commissioner Higgins. Thank you. Thank you for having me here tonight. Did everybody pick up a copy of uh, my presentation? If you didn't, there are some I'll more at this table over there. Um, late in my uh, life, I've learned to do PowerPoint presentations. I kind of get a big chuckle out of them. Uh, because it's my goal to make the prints as large as I can make it so that even I can read it. And um, so I hope that it's... Um, it's got some good information in here, and it's large enough that you can read it too. Uh, so, when um, when we always start talking about counties, I I talk about both uh, Minnesota, Hennepin specifically, and nationwide. There are 3,069 counties in the United States. The commissioners in some states are called supervisors. In some states, they're called freeholders. Some states, they're called judges. But we all kind of, you know, work for the counties, uh, whatever we're called. So uh, counties have, in Minnesota, uh, county commissioners, elected sheriff, and elected uh, county attorney. Some of our smaller, um, now I feel like I'm echoing. Am I too loud? Okay. Uh, some of our smaller counties also have elected auditor and recorder and treasurer. And when I was uh, chairing the state and local government committee in the Senate, um, every year we'd have a half a dozen to a dozen counties who wanted permission to not elect those, um, those uh, positions anymore. In Hennepin <laughs> County, I think in 1967, we gave up electing auditor and treasurer because they are, you know, kind of professional functions and we wanted to have really good people. But in some of our smaller counties, we, we still uh, see them elected. In Minnesota, we have five, four counties that don't have 5,000 people. 
We have 20 counties that don't have 10,000 people living in them. And then we have Hennepin County with 1.2 million. Mm -hmm. And yet our state government says we all do the same thing. And it's just proportional. Um, one of the, the uh, odd committees that I served on over the years was uh, in the Department of Human Services at the state. And it was about um, whether counties were performing the functions that they were allowed or required to uh, quickly enough. Performance measurement uh, board. And one of the um, strange things that we had to work through was how we were actually going to uh, collect and gather the information from those very smallest counties. Because if the Hansen family moved from Cass County to Itasca County, or from um, Red Rock to Maurer County, um, people, the counties could see the, um, the the funding for those families go from one to the other. So how do we report that? And do we combine the 20 smallest counties and report it together? That's not accurate. Do we report in regions or do we have to, or did we have to actually figure out a way that we could report the information without it being identifiable to the families that were receiving the services? So um, it, that's one of the things that I think people don't actually even recognize about how counties work and how much we do. Mm -hmm. In Minnesota, we are um, uh, governed by the state law. The legislators uh, decide what work has to be done, and then the counties actually administer those programs. Um, so we are very much an arm of the state. Sometimes they actually pay us um, to do the work. It's seldom enough, um, but uh, we're appreciative of, of all of that funding. Um, in Minnesota, you know, for example, the county has handled two million uh, calls to 911 uh, a year, and the counties themselves actually uh, provide for 54 percent of the funding for child welfare cases. Well, and. Uh, that is a state service, and yet the counties are doing the work and, and funding it because the need is there and we have to. So I talked to, uh, so slide three is uh, a little bit about Hennepin County, and you can see we've got 1.2 million residents and 355,000 of them are under age five. Um, we are 611 square miles. Ramsey County is the smallest county by size. Um, but we're not far from that at 611. Uh, we have 45 municipalities and of course our largest municipality is the city of Minneapolis. 39% uh, of our county budget goes to health and human services, our biggest department by far, and uh, some of the most difficult and gut-wrenching work that county uh, employees do is there in the human services department. And here's a statistic for you, one quarter of all people who live in Hennepin County receive services from Hennepin County in some fashion or another. It, it, sliding fee, child care, assistance for your parents, um, uh, the traditional welfare programs, uh, temporary assistance to needy families, uh, all kinds of things uh, that Hennepin County uh, can touch so many people in our county. So that's a little bit about counties and a little bit about Hennepin. Um, we are just starting the budget process as a board this week. Um, our county administrator, David Huff, one of the most brilliant men you'll ever meet if you ever get the opportunity to meet him, um, proposed his budget two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, thereabouts. Um, and he proposed a maximum operating budget of $1.9 billion. Uh, that is a 5.5% increase from last year. When we uh, started the process, we, we just summarily cut $2 million out of that budget just to start with. Um, and as a reminder, it is the maximum amount. What we set uh, by board action is the maximum uh, amount of money that our budget will be. Um, and we will come in under that. We, 
in my years there, I think we've always come under that. Um, but by law, we have to set a maximum uh, budget and levy. And so that was our first action. Um, we have a capital budget, the building budget of $475 million. So that's a $2.4 billion uh, budget. And it's a lot of money and it's a lot of paper that we wade through to, uh, to make our decisions on what are the right things to fund. We, the seven of us on the county board, we, uh, we are liberal and conservative. We are urban and suburban, but we all have a, 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 a real sense that we are spending other people's money, the OPMs, and that we want to do that prudently and wisely. And when we need to, we uh, will allocate funding from one area to another. Um, you know, as we go through a year, we'll find out that um, this project really did, didn't need that much money. But over here, they do, and so we'll move things around. Uh, and we try to, to con constantly monitor what's going on so that we can make those adjustments as we have to. Um, so I was in the Senate with um, 67 members, and then I went to the county board with seven. And one of the things that um, I've enjoyed about county government, uh, the county board, is that with seven, you can be much more nimble. You can innovate and be more creative about how you get things done. And then in Hennepin County's um, favor, we have some of the smartest people you'll ever know working in government, working for us at Hennepin County. And they um, try to uh, make the case for why they want to change, why they want an addition and subtraction, why we need to do things differently. So um, it, it's, a, it's a lovely thing to be able to work with such um, smart professional people. In the last uh, two, three years, we have been uh, starting to look at our funding, uh, uh, our spending, through the lens of disparity reduction. I have started calling it the defining issue of our time. It is um, uh, disgraceful at the um, disparities that exist in Minnesota and in Hennepin County, everything from educational attainment and opportunity to uh, jobs and access to transportation and just all the way down the line. So you'll see at the top of page three this wheel um, that we have um, put together that shows that, that uh, as you work on one piece of disparity reduction, you can also affect many other pieces uh, that, that um, can also change lives. If you work on housing, you'll you'll see that uh, you know income will change. If you work on education, you'll see that income and employment are all connected in there. And it's uh, it's a good chart that shows the work that we do. Um, but what we know in Hennepin County is that our work is indeed uh, driven by the disparities that exist between residents, um, and that we want those disparities to be eliminated and uh, in doing that work what we're finding that we're having to do is changing from being reactive in how we deliver our services to um, a prevention and early intervention model you know being upstream as some people say to to get ahead of the problems so they aren't problems one of the uh, best examples in that is work that we've been doing in the last um, two or three years, I'm sorry, um, uh, in child protection. We have, uh, we were uh, part of the governor's task force on uh, child protection issues, and that task force, I think, gave 105 different ways that we were supposed to do things differently. Um, so, in doing that work, we are trying to get upstream of the problem, and, and what we are finding that that uh, uh, delivers to us is uh, somewhere where we need to spend a lot, a lot more money and hire a lot more people. Uh, when I went to the uh, Association of Minnesota Counties meeting after the task force had delivered its, uh, its recommendations, one of the rural county 
County Commissioners said, I'm so mad, we're going to have to hire a half a person to do this work. And I said, hmm, Hennepin County's going to hire 120. <laughs> so, um, you know, be lucky it's a half, but we are, uh, we are needing to do this work, and it has to be done. Um, because the lives of the children in the system and their families depend on it. So um, that is a big budget driver for us. Um, so uh, a little bit about how we're going to work this year on uh, putting together our budget. Actually, day after tomorrow, we're going to start uh, working through the budget. And we, uh, we get... Uh, the, the work organized by kind of line of business. So we're going to start with libraries and operations. And here's the executive summary that I got um, yesterday. We can pass it around. It, this, is, this is the book that we will be working from. It will tell you the revenue and expenditures uh, for uh, various programs. It will tell you, the footnotes are always really interesting. Uh, that's where some of the most uh, important information is found in the footnotes. I love that. Um, but that's uh, uh, how, what, how we'll start working through the, the process. This year we, yeah. Is, it, is that online somewhere? Yes, it is. Uh, and if you go to the top of page four, uh, the, the two uh, links are there. Oh, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. www.hennepin.us slash your hyphen government slash budget hyphen finance slash budgets <laughs> yeah but I know it'll you can you can also uh, so far there's you know uh, probably 150 pages uh, in on that that page and it will be updated as we go through there I I would suspect that that uh, little book is uh, on there now um, and this is the big budget book that that each, uh, each of us starts with, and then each each book uh, gets put into here along with a whole lot of other information. And I looked and all of this information is already on the website, so you all can follow along with it too. We will live stream all of our budget hearings. Uh, and you can see the link there, it's very similar to the one that I just um, read off. Um, so uh, one of the other pieces of paper that's over at the table that I don't think I picked up is the actual um, calendar, uh, the schedule for all of our, our meetings. There you go, that piece. And uh, you can just tune right in and listen. You're always welcome to come down to the county board uh, meeting itself and, and uh, sit there uh, right with us. Um, and some people do. I mean, that's always, um, I think, very... Uh, a very good way to um, see, you know, people getting a lot of information all at, at one time about one uh, one subject. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when we're almost done uh, with all of these budget hearings, you know, whether it's human services or transportation or public safety or uh, libraries and and, and whatever else is on that list. Uh, we will have a truth in taxation hearing uh, in the evening of November 27th at 6 o'clock at night. We'll open up the, the parking ramp underneath and it'll be free parking for people to come and they can come and talk to us about their individual taxes or they can talk to us about um, you know, the, the budget proposal in, in broad terms if they would like. Um, we often will have people who have very specific to themselves issues. So we always make sure that we have the county assessor. We actually have the city assessor come over as well. Uh, and a lot of our staff who can, uh, you know, they'll have their laptops there and they'll be able to look up somebody's uh, own individual property tax uh, documents and so they can try and work through if there is a problem. The first year that I was at the county board and um, we were doing truth and taxation hearings. There were a whole lot of people there who seemed to know each other. I was kind of surprised by it. Well, it turned out that on uh, some little peninsula in Lake Minnetonka, the people who had, uh, who were on one side of the peninsula all got pretty big tax increases, and the people on the other side did not. <laughs> and so 
they were all there to go, wait a minute, you know, Jack and, and Mabel, who are be, behind us, you know, we're 2167, they're 2166, we got a 15% increase and they got zero, so there's something wrong. Um, so you never know who's going to be at the truth and taxation hearings or how many people, but it's, uh, it's one way that people are, can come and talk to their uh, elected county uh, leaders and talk about, you know, something that affects everybody, their property taxes and their county taxes in general. So you're all invited to come down on the evening of November 27th, starting at 6 o'clock, uh, if you have uh, something you want to talk to us about. And then on um, December 11th, we will continue to work on, on the budget a little bit more, uh, and we will have some uh, opportunity for the commissioners to actually have amendments to, the, to um, add a project that is specific to your district or um, you know, it might, be, it might be that you think that uh, County Attorney Mike Freeman needs um, an immigration attorney in his office. Uh, so, you know, you put together a, a budget amendment to put the amount of money to hire, it, uh, hire that person and, uh, and then set that in place. Or it might be that you uh, decided that some program really isn't working well and then you would uh, have an amendment to delete that program. So it is... Um, uh, that's, a, that's a hard, long day of work, and um, yet it is one way that the commissioners kind of put our stamp on the budget. Um, and then we'll, we'll do final passage of the budget on uh, Tuesday, December 11th, and that's a regular board meeting that will start at 1.30 in the afternoon. So that's our process. Um, and then the, the other pages here are... Um, a little bit more information about uh, the proposed capital budget. Uh, we spend a lot of money on roads and bridges and bus rapid transit and light rail, uh, public safety and judiciary facilities, uh, and of course health and human services facilities. We are in the process of um, planning for a new medical examiner's office. I don't know if anybody's ever had the opportunity to go to the medical examiner's office. Right now, it's in the shadow, the shadow of, of the uh, U.S. Bank Stadium, in what used to be like a grocery store um, wholesale building, and it shares this building with the crime lab, um, and it is very small. And uh, we do the medical examiner work for. Um, Dakota County and, uh-huh, I should know this, Scott County? Two other counties, anyway. Um, and so uh, we are in the process of uh, starting to plan for building a new facility somewhere else uh, in a right-sized space. And, uh, and so we have some money in there for uh, that medical examiner facility as well. Uh, North Point Health and Wellness Center in the district I get to represent in North Minneapolis has uh, for years wanted to expand. They are bursting at the seams. And uh, we have uh, money in this uh, budget for that expansion as well. You may have been seeing some of the publicity around the corner of Penn and Plymouth. North Point is uh, there at Penn and Plymouth. And uh, Thor Construction has just opened its big, new, beautiful world headquarters, and uh, the Estes Funeral Chapel, the, uh, I think it's the only African-American owned funeral chapel in the city, um, has a, a new building that Hennepin helped build, uh, and they are in the southwest corner. The Minneapolis Urban League headquarters is in the northeast corner, and then um, the funeral chapel will, the old funeral chapel uh, is being with, acquired by Hennepin County, and then the North Point expansion can use that space as well as um, the space that we do, so we can get that, that facility right-sized as well. One of the things that I love about uh, the work that we did collaboratively there on the corner was uh, we had uh, men who were on probation or uh, sentenced to time in the workhouse who were helping build the Estes Funeral Chapel. And the contractor uh, that uh, did that project uh, is a wonderful woman uh, 
who really understood that part of her work was to help people learn how to be in the construction trades. And so she agreed to work with um, these men who are incarcerated or just um, released from incarceration and is helping them learn uh, a trade. And uh, the pride that they have in being able to go past a building and say, I helped build that is just immeasurable. So the work that we do there is really important. And uh, I think in, in the North Point building, we'll be doing some more of that, that kind of um, social entrepreneur work to uh, help people who are our county clients. And it's one, one more way that we can uh, do, uh, do better by people. So I think that part of the, um, the title of this presentation is supposed to be about transparency. So um, I tried to figure out all the ways that uh, we are transparent. We are often called the hidden government. So, um, I, you know, we know that and we try to do better. But boy, we are kind of the hidden government. Um, but as we talked about a little bit earlier, the spreadsheets in the budget book are all on our county website. And they will be updated through our entire budget process. And in fact, all of those documents going back to 2008 are on the, um, the, the website. And you can look back and see historically what we have spent uh, on uh, various items. Uh, our budget hearings are uh, live streamed in the archives, so you can go and look at them whenever it's convenient for you. Our truth and taxation hearing is open to the public. It's in the evening, and we provide free parking downtown. Um, our final action is at our regular board meeting, um, and that is uh, also televised and live streamed. Um, our staff is very responsive to any media uh, requests. They answer requests like every hour on the hour, so we try not to let any grass grow under their, under their feet. Um, we have the Citizens Academy. Has anybody ever participated in, in either the city or the county Citizens Academy? You learn so much about how your government works. Um, every, every class has maybe 25 or 30 people from all over the county, uh, somebody from all seven commissioner districts. And um, over a series of, of I, mostly evenings, I think. Was, were they all evenings when you went? Yeah. Um, you go out to the public works building in Edina, Medina, uh, you'll come down and see how the courts are run. You can go and see how um, various uh, human services offices work um, and, and really get a good sense of it. Did you get a tour of the jail? Yes. Yeah. My favorite was the water treatment. Oh, the water treatment. Yeah, there you go. So, um, so it's really an interesting thing to do in one more way that, that you know, we make our work not quite so invisible. Yes? How often are those uh, run? I think they're twice a year, if I remember right. I think we just have an academy just now starting. I got a list of the, the participants sometime in the last couple of weeks. So it should be starting here pretty soon. Um, yes? So is it just uh, first come, first serves for us getting on a, on a list? I or? think so. Um, and then, you know, maybe District 2's got 20 people who want to do it in District 1 has, you know, three, so uh, there might be some people who don't get in just because we really do work to get all seven districts represented, so it might be a holdover or something, but, but we do that. So I, uh, most of the, the commissioners in some fashion are um, also involved in uh, social media. We have a couple who are kind of adamantly not um, <laughs> wanting to engage in uh, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and things, uh, and they work more in kind of the traditional media um, outlets. We all have uh, electronic newsletters. I send, I think, a couple of thousand newsletters. Mine went out last week. Um, and that's an, another good way that you can um, find out what's going on in your district specifically. But we do have a page on the website. So it, when you go to the website, do a little wandering around inside the website and see what you can find. But you can sign up uh, to receive newsletters on everything under the sun uh, at Hennepin County, whether it's the uh, environmental uh, 
and energy department in there, they have what they call green notes that comes out periodically. It has great information about everything from recycling and composting uh, to uh, the Master Gardener program and, and a, a lot of the work that they do there. But it's all on one page and you can just, you know, click the little boxes of things that you're interested in. I think you can even click and get an email saying, oh, don't forget to pay your property taxes. Which, by the way, are coming up here really soon. You need to pay your property taxes. Yes, ma'am. Is it um, the same thing as GovShop delivery? Uh, how we send them out? Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. We use the same platform as the city, I think. Gotcha. Yeah. So, uh, so we do really try our best to um, be out there and uh, tell people what we're doing and uh, one of these days we won't be known as the hidden government, but um, it, it is, uh, it, it's like an everyday thing. You have to figure out who needs to know what and then figure out how to get the information to them. I'm a big fan of Twitter myself. Um, uh, the, the head of the National Association of Counties says I have a Twitter addiction, and he might not be wrong, but um, he, uh, but it's such a great way to get information about what I'm doing, what others uh, are doing, what the county is doing, uh, what other counties in, in all over the country. Uh, and um, so I really like the, the ease of putting information out uh, on social media. So I think I probably talked way longer than you wanted me to. Um, so why don't we open it up for some questions? And I'll. Uh, oh, I, I did want to go through and show you some of this other paper, just in case that you didn't get a copy of it. Um, there's one that starts out with memo, and that is the actual administrator's uh, budget address to the county board. And it lays out uh, some of his reasoning about why uh, he is proposing the budget that he is proposing. It's a really, uh, it's a good document. You know, you've probably heard people say that a budget is a moral document. And this, uh, this, when you read through this, you can see uh, how the the departments really um, see the work that has to be done, and and kind of prioritize what we need to do. So, um, if you're interested in all things budget, that's that's a, a good document to read. I did bring um, a couple of uh, budget documents from last year. We don't have this little book done yet, uh, but the uh, beginning pages of it particularly give some highlights about Hennepin County and it's in really small print um, but it talks about some of the um, uh, proposals that we're working on and uh, a little bit about uh, about uh, last year's or this current budget. Uh, it'll show you where the money came from, it'll show you where the money is going to uh, so that's it's, know that it's the current year, but um, but it's still lots of really good information. Um, I did, uh, yeah, and then there's a bookmark that, that gives much of the same information as in that, that book in a little different way. Uh, another uh, document, uh, bookmark size thing, is, a, is some data about our actual Hennepin County workforce. We have... Um, really made an effort to um, figure out how we can uh, look more my, like the community that we serve uh, in our workforce. And so uh, we are actually tracking how many employees are people of color, how many are women, uh, what ages they are. The average age of an employee in Hennepin County is 46. Um, but we also have a big silver tsunami coming. Uh, people who are uh, in their 60s going to be retiring in the next um, you know five to ten years and you can see uh, you know kind of the uh, the breakout of, of who works for us and, and you know like 56 percent of the directors the, the kind of line staff are, are eligible to retire sometime in the next five years so that the opportunities that that presents for our other employees as they can move up the ladder uh, and we can hire new uh, New employees is, is uh, really wonderful to think about, even if, if it's not so frightening to think about that. That's an awful lot of people that uh, are going to be retired. Yes, sir. Uh, um, I, I thought it was very interesting, and I just want to know how is the interest in those numbers and/or that commitment to 
people that the county employs um, actually apply to the people who sit on the board? Um, we are um, we are seven white folks on the county board. Uh, I'm not running again. I'm um, I'm retiring at the end of the year, and both of the people who uh, came through the primary uh, in my district are people of color. Um, so uh, we are going to change that dynamic come January 8th. Um, then in um, both of the other districts that are uh, on the ballot this year, there is uh, a woman of color running in each of those districts. Uh, so, uh, you know, whether the incumbent wins or whether the, uh, the non-incumbent wins, uh, you know, is, is a... Uh, let me just go through the rest of the documents just real quickly, um, and then I'll do it. So you can see the, uh, the half-page uh, picture memorial uh, uh, thing. This is an invitation to you. Um, Victor Memorial Drive in North Minneapolis, the, the northwest corner of Minneapolis, is the largest World War I monument in the country. And I don't know if people know that. There is a marker for every man and woman who died in service in World War I from uh, Hennepin County. Um, and, uh, and November 11th this year is the 100th anniversary of the armistice. So we are going to have a remembrance, a commemoration uh, that, that day, November 11th, uh, from 10 until 11 in the morning. Uh, the, the armistice was signed, the documents were actually signed at, at 11, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, which is why we're doing it on a Sunday morning. Um, and there were those who said, oh, we should do it in the summer. We should have the celebration in the summer. And I'm like, no, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. And if you have not been up to see the flagpole, um, it is uh, it was redone seven or eight years ago, maybe. And um, there is a cement marker along the side of the flagpole. And at 11 o'clock in the morning, on November 11th, the shadow of the flagpole goes right down through that marker. Mm -hmm. And it's marvelous to see. and. Uh, the, the architect who, who uh, did the, uh, re, the renovation of the memorial wanted to have something that um, really brought that day and time into place. And so come join us at uh, 10 in the morning, a Sunday morning on November 11th uh, for that commemoration. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here? Uh, if you know of uh, somebody who is experiencing a mental health crisis, uh, here's the... the child crisis uh, hotline and information. And then the last piece that I will talk about is uh, a piece from the Association of Minnesota Counties, and it's entitled Why Counties Matter. If you actually do follow me on Twitter, you'll see that I write um, hashtag counties matter a lot. Um, and it talks about what counties do, and, uh, and there are some very uh, uh, interesting statistics in here. You know, Minnesota counties oversee 3,174 polling places, and we coordinated 28,665 election judges in 2014. Uh, we processed more than 8,000 voter registration uh, forms, and um, so I, I think you'll, you'll be interested in uh, this because it gives a good sense of what counties do. So again, I will stop. Ian, you had a question. <coughs> Well, I had asked you just privately about chemical dependency counselors in the Minneapolis schools. I retired from South High in Minneapolis as an assistant principal, and my right-hand person was a chemical dependency counselor, Clara Bacanada, mm -hmm. and we, I was in charge of Little Earth, you know, the, not for the All Nations team, and then in AAUW, at, we had the head of the Shakopee Women's Prison come and speak to us. And the statistics were they had out of the 750 women, 180 were Native American, 80 African American, and the rest white. And we have to do something about our 
you know, our Native Americans, and of course now they're they're in the homeless, you know, situation. And uh, Alice Mormon and I went, and we the League of Women Voters supervises their elect, you know, their in-house election. So we sat there for a whole day, and you hear all the things that are going on. And so I just I just wonder what the county, what I, I'm sure because of the homeless now that you're you're going to invest a lot of money, but it just seems like we should be more involved with the prevention. <laughs> now we're you know having to rescue all these people that are there. So I just wanted to ask you, what are the county plans for our Native Americans? Well, right now we're doing kind of the all hands on deck for the folks in the encampment. Um, there are county staff there every, every, every day. There, so there. Um, uh, we um, we have been able to offer housing to uh, a lot of the, the folks who are there, um, and it's their decision whether the housing that we uh, can find for uh, them is acceptable or reasonable or um, you know, workable for their family situation. Uh, the opioid crisis is, uh, I think, going to be with us for a while. Uh, and it is devastating. For, here's another opioid problem. Uh, for the first time that people can remember uh, the children who are being taken out of homes into foster care uh, in Hennepin County, the main reason is because they're, of their parents' uh, opioid addiction. It's always been uh, reports of uh, abuse and neglect that have been the number one. What we're finding this year is that it's the opioid addiction. Um, and I, I was at a statewide county thing uh, a couple of weeks ago, and county after county after county was saying the same thing. Um, it is, uh, it isn't so easy as the doctors prescribed too many pills and somebody got hooked. Uh, the, the illegal uh, narcotics now are overwhelming that supply uh, hugely. Um, but we have we have people who can help at the county with housing issues. We have people help get into treatment. We have people uh, who can help get your kids. Uh, a lot of the kids who, that are uh, living in the encampment right now aren't going to school or aren't going regularly. Uh, we have folks who will help with that. Um, and, and so uh, the city, the county, even the state. Uh, uh, sent over some money to help us. Uh, we accepted the, the grant today in, a, in the, the meeting. Um, so we are really working hard on it. But if you, if you um, have access to a computer, there's uh, a, a, an interesting little video on the National Association of Counties website. So naco.org slash opioids. And it's a little video of all the ways that the opioid crisis affect, affect, <clears throat> affects counties. And it takes, I don't know, two, three minutes or something. But watch it. And you'd be, um, I was kind of surprised. I hadn't thought of uh, all the ways that it does touch uh, uh, the, the county. So we are, uh, we are trying. We are working hard. We are working with our partners, uh, the nonprofits, the other, uh, you know, like I said, the city, the state. Uh, and nothing seems to be fast. We have an affordable crisis, uh, housing crisis uh, in the entire state, truth be told. Mm -hmm. um, you can't build houses overnight. You can't, uh, you know, plus they, they cost a lot of money to build. And uh, so what options can we make available? Uh, are there uh, mobile homes? Are there tiny houses? Are there buildings that have currently another use that we can use? Does somebody have the top floor of a building that they're not using? Um, any ideas of ways that we can help people? Winter's coming. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's not going to be pleasant in a tent here really soon. 
And so uh, the crisis is near and it is very visible and it keeps, it, it is out in front of everybody. Uh, and yeah, we have, we have work to do. Okay. Um, Thank you for bringing me to Linda. Um, you indicated that you have hearings um, for regarding the budget. Do you have online comment area also that people can? Not that I know of. Let me, before I leave, let me uh, write the note down to, okay. to ask whether we can do that. And along those lines and everything, when you do have people come to testify and everything like that, is there a time limit? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, and basically how? Three minutes. Three minutes? Okay. Yeah. Sounds like a long time until you start talking. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, people have to pre-sign? Uh, when they come in, there's a table at the okay. door. Okay. They sign um, what they, you know. Uh, there may be two or three public hearings in one uh, meeting. And so you sign up for whichever one is the one you want. When they're the budget hearings, it's obviously the budget hearing. So you know, we'll sign up there. And then mm -hmm. as we go through, then you just get called up. Mm -hmm. Yes. What? How much money and what kind of solutions <coughs> has the county uh, found or done? What have they actually done money-wise uh, regarding the housing crisis? I mean, have you bought something or subsidized something or what are your current plans? And what are you trying to try to do? We have, uh, we do not own uh, apartments or houses. Um, the city basically doesn't either. Um, so we uh, have grants available for uh, for, for housing uh, through our housing available? grants right. funding. Um, so we have two or three pots of money that that builders uh, use. One of them is the, um, of course, everything has an acronym. So AHIF, the Affordable Housing Incentive Fund, uh, where we do two or three rounds, usually two rounds a year. Uh, where uh, de developers or builders will uh, tell us about their project. Uh, is it going to be affordable at what level? Is it 30% of median income? Is it 60%? How close are you to being ready to go? Uh, how many units of housing is it going to be? All those kinds of things. And, and, uh, and our housing staff um, make a recommendation to us about which ones are are uh, ready to go and can use the funding that we have available uh, right there. We also have transit-oriented <laughs> development funds, so TOD funds, uh, same sort of process, and we do them, I think, <laughs> twice a year as well. Um, but we will have two or three times as many grants as we, uh, requests as we have funding available um, for uh, for those grants. Uh, when we started our budget hearing this year, I, I told you that we, uh, we took money out of the budget right away. Well, we took that same money and we put it into the housing budget. So, um, How would you put the money into the housing? What do you do? Do you pay for construction? Or do you reduce the amount of money that you pay for taxes? Or what do you do exactly? Well, these two funds are actually straight up cash. Uh, and they are uh, meant to, uh, they're usually kind of helping fill the last gap. Um, you know, every developer probably gets funds for their project from, you know, 10 or 20 different sources. Um, and, and, you know, ours is one of those sources that, that they can so sometimes. So construction? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, we have a couple of others that we're involved in. Um, one is um, another acronym, ERF. It may be my favorite, ERF, um, is the Environmental Response Fund. And a lot of times people will find a great site to build on, but it's uh, the land underneath it, uh, it is very polluted. And so we have some grants to help clean up that, uh, that the soil before they, uh, before they build. Um, and then the fourth one is uh, a project that we uh, got involved in last year or the year before um, called the NOAA Fund. And it is the Naturally Occurring Affordable Housing. Uh, and um, 
one of the nonprofits uh, here in the state decided that he should, they should put this fund together to help um, not have apartment buildings, it's mostly for larger buildings, uh, but not have apartment buildings uh, being sold and then the new owner says, you all have to move out and I'm going to make your nice affordable housing into a luxury apartment. And, um, and, and that we lose that, that naturally occurring uh, affordable housing. So Hennepin County put $25 million into that fund to start, uh, it was one of the, the startups of it. The city has put money in and I don't remember how much they put in uh, and, and foundations around the state have also been doing that. And, um, that has been a way that is, is a very visible way uh, of um, helping keep the affordable housing that we do have. So, yes, ma'am. Um, I'm wondering about the transit-oriented development fund and the environmental grants. Um, is there knowing what we know now about our affordable housing issues and, and why we're focusing on no and all these other things? <laughs> Is there a reason why those that that those two pots of money are still going to market rate developments instead of affordable housing developments? Um, I don't. Mm -hmm. So the transit-oriented development is often going to a market rate development or high market rate, then helping them out. And I'll, I'll tell you, like I've got a developer around the corner who is doing a high market rate development, and he's getting. Cleanup funds. We got cleanup funds from the county. And so it's like if we want the affordable housing, we want not want to put all that money towards that. So. Well, some of the um, some of the market rate buildings will uh, put some units of affordable um, rental in their unit in their buildings, and that probably was uh, a factor in why we decided to go with that. Um, mm -hmm. I you know I, I can't tell you. Why not the bat? I, I think that most of them are. To reassign that, I mean, that's where the money goes to, to consider reassigning that money in the next budget towards affordable construction instead of giving it to the market. Well, we're not going to take money away from it. No. You know, but it, as it is one of the factors that we look at when we when we go forward on it. Yeah. And it's always a good reminder that we. Uh, the housing that we need right now is affordable housing, and, and we can do, you know, a small part in it. Yeah. Um, just to clarify, this is an annual budget? Yes. Okay. And you, you have a slide in here about personnel. Mm -hmm. um, it's a 2.7% decrease. Is that typical? It is not typical, but we have hired and hired and hired and hired these last couple of years. Um, and... Um, and so I think we're at a point now where we're starting to see where things are changing. I, I would suspect that most of uh, these will be just attrition. It will be people who are retiring or leaving, and we're going to leave the positions open this year. Yes? Can we talk a little bit about the, um, the, the two independents, the sheriff and the um, county attorney, and the council's relationship to, with them, um, uh, I don't know, uh, to, if it's to law or to the connection, I guess the connection, not necessarily relationship, personal, personality-wise, but uh, connection, I guess. We all have an, uh, an election certificate. It looks just like everybody else's. So um, they're an elected official of the county, just like the seven board members are. Um, they uh, put together a budget uh, just like everybody else does, and then they uh, bring it forward uh, first to county administration and then to us. So we approve their budget. We have, um, we have often uh, large battles uh, with the sheriff's department lately uh, because they will have a lot of overtime. They will have a lot of they will kind of um, have some budget issues that um, we want to explore really thoroughly with the sheriff and his department as to why it's happening and how it's going to be different next year. Um, but 
you know, they, they run the jail, they run uh, the 911 center, they run the crime lab. Um, the sheriff's department uh, is the police department for a lot of our small, particularly western suburban um, cities. Uh, they don't have their own police departments, and so the sheriff's department uh, deputies patrol those areas. Um, the county attorney, the county attorney, I don't know how you explain the county attorney. Um, they're all those lawyers that are over there. <laughs> um, and, and their support staff, and um, they, they bring a budget forward to us as well. Um, in addition, we have the public defenders, who are technically states, state employees, um, and they, uh, Hennepin County needs more public defenders than what the state pays for, and so Hennepin County pays for some of those employees as well. Um, in addition, then we have one whole uh, side of the building that is the, the fourth judicial uh, district, the, the court system, all the Hennepin County attorney, or not the attorneys, uh, the, um, the judges, who are not our employees, they're, they're you know, judicial district employees, so they're, I suppose you could say that they're maybe employees of the Supreme Court, you know, the, the big state judicial system. Um, they are there in our building, we are, um, we work pretty well with them. They will sometimes have issues, uh, for example, a couple of years ago we needed, uh, to find a new jury assembly room. Um, if you've ever been on, anybody been on jury duty? Yeah, you were, you were probably down underneath and you heard every truck that went over <laughs> overhead because you were down in the basement. Uh, um, because our building goes over a, a street, you know, it's an H and it goes over a street. So um, we, uh, we moved the jury assembly room up to the 24th floor of the court side of the building, uh, made it a, very nice space and um, one of the reasons the courts wanted us to do that um, was uh, because when they when a judge would call for a jury then somebody had to go down to the basement to find the, the, the folks in the jury assembly room assemble them bring them all up through the security system um, and then get them up into the courts and so uh, one of the efficiencies that we could do by making that change was everybody comes through the, the security system when they come in in the morning and then they stay within the system and, and, um, and so the, the, the juries are seated much quicker and the, the whole system there works much more efficiently. And that was a, um, that was a, a capital project that we, we did a couple of years ago, so it would have been in the budget a couple of years ago. <coughs> So that's us. We, we hang out all together. Yeah. Um, in the beginning, you had talked about a study, I, I think, that the county had uh, commissioned. And you had said something about 105 different ways that you were or could or should do things differently. Can you mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit? Um, I think what I was talking about was the governor's task force on, um, on child protection. And uh, there were uh, really smart people from all over the state who got together and uh, uh, tried to figure out what was happening with the child protection system. There was a, there was a time when um, kids were automatically kind of pulled into the system. Then there was a change made somewhere along the line, legislatively, I think, where you could uh, get the information and then do what they called screening them out. That the information didn't kind of rise to the level of further action. Um, then there uh, was a time when all that seemed to work and, and then there were a couple of very high profile uh, deaths of young children uh, and and the reports of what happened to those kids were um, a mixture of being screened out or nothing further happening. So the, um, the legislature decided that we had to go back the other way and turn it back around the other way. And then so then the, the other recommendations that came from that uh, task force 
are ones that each county is trying to work through. And some of them are very expensive. Some they, they kind of you know put them in um, in order of preference of what you do first. And so I, I think every county is probably in a different different place, but we're all trying to work our way through those to to do what the task force recommended to make sure that the kids were safe. Yeah. I have to admit that's a huge tome of a budget that you need to go through. Mm -hmm. Do you or your fellow commissioners have any type of, should we say, criteria that you weigh how you prioritize things, how you analyze it, anything that helps you slog through it? <laughs> we, probably just like every other organization, we have commissioners who will take these books at home and they'll bring them back and they'll be highlighted all over and tabbed and, and notes written on them. And then, um, I, I have to say, I think the budget is the worst thing that we do every year. I detest working on the budget. And so I'm, um, I'm not um, as, I'm not as diligent as many of my colleagues are. Um, we, many of us are uh, kind of experts in one area of it. Uh, like Peter McLaughlin really knows that transportation stuff. And so um, you, you can tell that his knowledge gained over all of his years in, in uh, elected office and working on transportation and light rail and bus rapid transit and all of that, um, that he has a real sense of what, what those lines in the budget mean. Um, uh, Mike Opat has kind of been our lead person on child protection. When he talks about child protection stuff, you put your paper down and you listen to what he has to say because he really does know that and what those numbers in that book will mean. Um, so we do have, have some people who are uh, I'm the worst one of the bunch. I'm dreadful at it. So Who's the most focused on the disparity issue that we have in our... Well, I like to think it's me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, truth be told, it's all of us. Um, because we do see such... Uh, we see it as such an important work. So we all have an eye on it. Um, we, uh, I think you'd be proud of us at the questions I, that we can sorry, ask. Sorry, I, I don't want to take questions, but I went uh, two Sundays ago to the Isaiah meeting over in North Minneapolis, and it was all about getting people informed about our county officials, and I wear two hats. I've, I've spent many, many hours at the legislature with Isaiah about the mass incarceration and our the you know the unfairness to our immigrants and so they they are going to the Isaiah people are, are informing people they're having holding forums in churches and so on but it's the county you know uh, government that we really need to be very much you know advocates for looking out for our you know, our people that are at risk, and, and the League of Women Voters with wonderful positions on immigration and also restoring the vote, which we haven't been able to do. And I, so I just I wanted you to know that besides the League of Women Voters, the, the Isaiah group, they are really working hard to inform people to turn over their ballot and know who the judges are, who the county officials are. No. Yeah. I, have you been informed about that? Um, I have not been to any of the Isaiah forums this year. Um, mm -hmm. I have in years past, but um, but not this year. Um, you brought up three things that are um, very interesting to me. You were talking about restoring the vote. Um, Keith Ellison, I think in his first year in the Minnesota House, and I, because we we only live like two blocks from each other. Um, but uh, we carried a bill to uh, get uh, people who were coming out of the prisons and onto probation to be able to, to vote. I think that was like 2006 or something, and we still haven't gotten it done. And, you know, this is Minnesota. Um, I can't tell you the number of people when I'm out door knocking or at various things. I'll say, have you voted you know, on election? Have you voted? No, I can't vote. I'm, I'm a felon. And so my next question is always, are you off paper? Are 
still in this system. You know? and, no, no, I've been off paper for two years. And so my next sentence is always, then you've been able to vote for two years. Um, so here, let me take you over and get you registered to vote and, and off you go. Um, but you know, especially people who um, maybe live in other states or have friends and relatives in other states who have uh, different laws. And there are states in the United States where you can never vote again uh, if you uh, are a felon. And Florida this year has uh, on their ballot uh, a question about whether to change that so that the, the people in Florida uh, who have not been able to vote since they've been able to, uh, that they since they've come out of prison will be able to vote and um, I'm very optimistic about that um, that the change is coming and I don't know who ever figured that taking away your right to vote was uh, was punishment for whatever crime you committed but um, what was the point? Say again. There's more the point, it's not the punishment. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's exactly right. So um, we we have a lot of work to do, and one day we will get that passed. But it has been a large slog. You know, I I um, I'll be really pleased when that happens. Uh, when I started at the Minnesota Senate in 1997, I'm old. Um, there were 5,000 people in the Minnesota prisons. When I left in 2012, there were 10,000 people in Minnesota's prisons. That's another touch for counties mm -hmm. because almost everybody that goes to prison comes out of prison, right? And then they go on probation. In Minnesota, um, you serve two thirds of your sentence behind bars and one third on probation out in the community. Well, who administers that probation system? That's the counties, right? Some people are just kind of probation, and then there's intensive supervised release, uh, where uh, they they are the folks who committed the worst crimes and um, didn't probably make as much progress as everybody would have hoped uh, they would have when they were incarcerated. So those intensive supervised uh, release uh, uh, Probation officers, oh, it's lost my word, probation officers, uh, in state law, there, there is uh, a requirement that they can have only a certain number of clients that they supervise because they're, um, they are the most difficult clients. And so uh, when you have twice as many people in the system as you did 16 years before, that's twice, almost twice as many people as the counties are supervising as well. So, yeah. Counties matter. They really do. I think we'll take one more question and then um, I see a hand the side of um, get into groups. Curious to know is is uh, Hennepin County the center of this Hennepin Health or is this a, that program for uh, County County? Hennepin Health and Hennepin Healthcare are, are several things. And I don't know why we have to name everything the same name. Mm -hmm. Um HCMC, the public hospital, which is uh, um, now it's kind of a public-private partnership thing, uh, has been just renamed to Hennepin Healthcare. I will be old and I'll still be calling it HCMC, but um, that's that name. Then we have the, um, the various pieces of the health system that are under Hennepin Health. Uh, so North Point Health and Wellness, the medical examiner, uh, HCMC is, I think, under that as well, a couple of other things. Then we have um, an accountable care organization called Hennepin Health. Right. <laughs> so, That's why I'm yeah, it's like you, we have only business. two words to use. So the $262 million is probably the medical center? Yeah. 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 I don't know what the budget for the medical center is. Um, we have that in our voter article, yeah. <laughs> but I don't have it. Because <laughs> um, that ACO is a piece of the healthcare system in the county. I can't hear you, I'm sorry. That Hennepin, that ACO is just a piece. It's kind yes. of it's like it's like insurance. a little insurance company. Yeah. 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 We have um, a public insurance company. But so what's the Hennepin Health two hundred and sixty two million? Is that the 
can't tell you. Here. I, 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 I don't. I wouldn't know without um, going back to the documents what that one is. All right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. This has been. Um, I feel like I've just talked and talked and talked. So. Thank you. If I noted correctly, the county administrator is proposing a 5.5% property tax. Uh, entire that, budget. Increase. Yeah. Okay. And then that will also, well, well that, so that will come from property taxes? Then? Some of it. Most okay. of it, probably. Yeah. Yeah. One of so, the documents that we have in there is where, where does the money come from and where does the money yeah. go? And so go online, look. You know, to see where the revenue is, where the expenditures are, and show up at some of these hearings, and maybe also on November 27th. Um, so some of you want to, we're sort of going to dismiss, but if some of you want to um, get into small groups and maybe discuss some of your top priorities on the budget, please feel free to do so. We have a small group here, or make some comments. I do want to stick around for a few minutes, and um, Answer prayer questions. Remember, no civic buzz on um, November 6th. You can't understand what you're saying. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm loud. There will be no civic buzz in November because it's uh, it will be scheduled on election day. And other than that, if you'd like to get into stay or move into small groups and discuss, uh, Please do so. Carlin was saying that you can do that. Um, I'll stick around for a little while, but I'm going to go over to the bar and get a beer first, and then I'll be back. <laughs> you know, we all talk about it. Um, uh, and then, you know, making sure that we spend the people's money appropriately and wisely. That's something that um, we're all interested in doing. I've covered a lot of city council, and I think only one. Yeah, it's county meeting. You're very civilized compared to the oh, yeah. city council. Oh yeah, we are. <laughs> We're seven very nice people, and <laughs> yeah. uh, we, um, I think, we genuinely like each other. Mm -hmm. What does the county do as far as the lakes, or is that really a city? Um, lakes and wetlands, because there's. Uh, well, the sheriff's uh, sheriff patrols yeah. the waters, of course. Um, our environmental services folks work with a lot of the lake improvement districts, a lot of the uh, associations to, to make sure that our, our lakes are as, um, as healthy as they can be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got lots of folks with a lot of good uh, environmental knowledge that that it would be willing to come and talk to There's them. been somebody from the county involved. Glen, Glen Lake is a, is a uh, glacial lake, so mm -hmm. not spring fed, so it's... Oh, my. You know, it, 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 so, are well, you really shallow right now? Well, I'm not sure how shallow it is, but the long-term forecast, yeah, there's got to be a spring in there somewhere, but the long-term forecast for it is not very good. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's a fairly small lake. Yeah. It does have, are you going to head north? Well, um, it, I'm... We have, we have a three season cabin, so okay. you know it'll be a uh, you know. What about your political thing. future? What are you going to do beyond that? I'm not running for office again. I <laughs> I'm happy to turn that over to uh, the next generation <laughs> of people who want to do good things for the state. Do you miss the legislature? Some days. Like people were remarking on Twitter about uh, um, the civility. Mm -hmm. You know, that these were two men who disagreed on some things and agreed on other things. Mm -hmm. And through the entire um, discussion, not a harsh word was said, what, mm -hmm. not a nasty word was said. You know, they would agree with each other and say so. Yeah. And then if they disagreed, then they'd talk yeah. about why they disagreed. And yeah. it was, it, you know, it, political discourse has gotten so coarse lately yeah. that it was remarkable that enough that people... There were